Hey everybody, Pastor Clark Covington here. Welcome to Heartland Community Baptist Church Online Edition. We are back online. It's been, gosh, over a year, I think, since we've done an online service. But out of an abundance of caution, we are having an online service today to be safe because we have a physical church building and it is small. And so we don't want to spread any virus uh, around there. And so just out of an abundance of caution, we're doing an online service it's a little bit condensed. Uh, we don't have singing today, just some announcements, prayer requests, and then we'll go into the preaching, which I'll put into three parts to make it easy to watch and a little bit easier to edit. But again, thank you for joining me. Maybe you haven't uh, been to church lately. This is a great time to reconnect. Uh, good to see you. At least I can see the camera, but I'll just pretend I'm seeing you. So good to see you. And uh, we're really happy to uh, have you here today. Just a few announcements for our church. October 16th, that'd be a week from yesterday, uh, Lord willing, we'll be going to the Red Wolf Farm Corn Maze, and we'll meet at the church at 11 a.m., Lord willing, if uh, everything has cleared up with the virus. Um, that Sunday night, uh, which would be 1017, we have a practice singing and video setup, and so what that'll be, as we've talked about, is we're going to practice a bunch of uh, songs on Sunday night. And we're going to set up to film those songs for the internet. Amen. So that'll be a practice singing and video set up next Sunday night. Again, Lord willing, if there's a cont continuous outbreak or there is a danger there, what we can do is just bump it up another week. Uh, and then the 14th, which is unbelievably almost a month away. It was, I think we started announcing this. It was two months away. Uh, we are going to have a video service uh, with singing and preaching. That's Sunday the 14th. We're going to record that, to put that online, and we're going to be doing some extra songs there on the 14th. Uh, so that's uh, really exciting there. And be praying about our holiday uh, giving program. We always uh, try to do something at the holidays to be a blessing to the community. It's a great opportunity to reach people. So be praying about that, and we are going to settle on that. We'll have a meeting about that in the next couple of weeks, how we can give to the community, what we can do last year, I thought the Lord really blessed, and uh, we've seen the ministries that, that were supported through that do great things, and so we can't wait, uh, at least I can't wait, to get after it again. Okay, prayer requests. Be praying for our families. Be praying for my family, the Cruz family, Caleb's family. Uh, be praying for a postal worker friend of mine who had injuries from a car wreck. Uh, she's healed up, but I, I believe she still needs prayer. Amen. I've been praying for Mike Rice, Brother Mike Rice, uh, at Midview Baptist Church, and that the Lord hears, uh, heals him completely. I'll uh, be praying for Peggy and her family and all of those uh, that are dealing with her recovery. Help them, bless them, and let her get healed up. Uh, be praying for Francis, too, and, and her family. Be praying for the church, the ministries, uh, the community, the country, the nation, uh, and be praying uh, for uh, just uh, us to be used in some way to win souls to Christ. That's always our prayer request that we kind of end it with. Uh, and I'll go Lord in prayer and then we will jump into the message. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for anyone that may be watching online. We love you here today, Lord. And we just praise you for the opportunity to worship you, whether it be virtually or in person. We ask you now, Lord, for the next little bit to be with the preaching, Lord, by the working of the Holy Spirit, Lord, uh, just work the right heart in your people to have them know what you'd have them to know about this message, about the scripture we're going to go over, Lord. We love you. We praise you. And above all else, we ask you, Lord, to save those that are lost before it's eternally too late. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, today we are going to talk about the idea of, is anything too hard for God? And it may not be what you think it would be. It may not mean what you think it would mean. Uh, who God is might surprise you. That's point number one here today. Have you ever thought about how God is all powerful, how he knows everything, sees everything, and yet we live in a crazy world? Well, what does that mean? What does it mean for an all powerful God to have sovereign dominion over everything? And yet he's letting the devil loose for a season. He's letting things kind of look very chaotic. He's letting our lives be full of struggles and hardships and heartache. So who is this God and why is this happening? And I think that's a very relevant question. Here we are today. I'm in my home office, also the home studio, but in the home office, amen, preaching a church service. 20, 30 years ago, people would say 
that's odd. Why would you be doing that? But we're in the midst of a pandemic. We are a year and a half or almost two years into the pandemic. Look, the world is crazy. And who is our God? Well, number one, he's all powerful. Jeremiah 32, 27 is a piece of scripture I want to read. Not our text verse, but, but a good scripture to start here. Jeremiah 32, 27. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for me? Think about that. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that God is all powerful and that nothing is too hard for him? I hope you do. And the question then becomes, well, what is going on? And, and let's look at the context of this verse. In Jeremiah 32, 27, God is speaking to the Jews, the Jewish people, who are being very disobedient, and God is going to send Babylon to punish them and take them into a 70-year captivity because they had been so disobedient. You read the book of Jeremiah, it goes on and on about the disobedience of the Jews. Yet look at their posture. If you get into the book of Jeremiah, their posture, nothing seemed further off from, from, for them than being taken. They were in the promised land and they had Solomon's temple and they had great crops and they had prophets that were telling them everything was going to be great. How long have preachers here in America been telling people the end is near, telling people the time has come, telling people to get right with God? You know, look at 2 Peter 3. We did a Bible study on that recently on the radio. 2 Peter 3. The idea that there'll be scoffers in the last days that'll say, oh, from the beginning of the fathers, from the beginning of creation, they've said this, that the world was going to end and face judgment. It's not going to happen. And then Peter, very rightfully so, uh, cites the Bible and about how God had flooded the earth during Noah's time. What were they doing during Noah's time? They were building and buying and selling and giving themselves over to marriage. Does that not sound like today? You know, we have all of this judgment in our land, all of these problems in our land, and yet people are just acting like nothing is happening, like everything will be okay, like science would solve their problems. Only Jesus Christ can solve our problems, amen? They didn't want to hear Jeremiah's prophecy at that time. But does that make God a liar? He's not. He's not a liar. In court... If you don't want to hear what the judge tells you, uh, does that make the judge incorrect? If you cover your ears and say, I don't want to hear you, judge, does that make the judge incorrect? No. What does that do? That means you're still going to face punishment. You just don't want to hear it. Is that not what's happening today uh, with people today in this country and around the world? They don't want to hear what God's men and women are teaching and preaching about the truth that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. Amen. He's the only way to be saved. There's willful ignorance and disobedience of these people doomed into captivity. And so they were willfully ignorant. The idea that Again, they were closing their ears. They didn't want to know. They were saying, I don't care. I just want to believe that in the end, everything works out. And that if there's a God, that God is loving. Or maybe there's a hundred gods and they're all great and they're all on my side. But the truth is there's one God and he's all powerful. And so what I think you're kind of maybe grabbing a hold of, maybe the idea that I'm getting at, that if God's all powerful and we are living in an age where we just, where things are just seem to be falling apart at the seams, where there's shortages of coins and of chicken. There's shortages of chicken wings. That's a big deal. And I don't mean to make light of the situation, but there are shortages of all kinds of things. There's laws being enacted daily about uh, what you need. You might need to have proof of this or that to go here or there. We are living in the last days and God's allowed it for a reason because he can do what he pleases. And as he allowed the Babylonians to punish his own people, he is allowing our society to cripple and fall, even on those that love the Lord, because the time has come. The time has come for us to repent, for us to humble ourselves, uh, to seek his face and to call his name. We should fear God and we should trust him because that's what this comes down to, doesn't it? There's not a healthy fear of God. Anyone in our church that's hearing me preach this knows I sound like a broken record, that we need to fear God. We need to humble ourselves. We need to get in the book. Well, repetition's important, and uh, I can't say it enough that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again soon, but do you fear him today? Because think about this. If you say, I don't believe he's all-powerful, then you obviously don't know him, and you certainly don't fear him. Or if you say, I believe he's all-powerful, but I don't want to get to know him, or I don't want to think about it, I want to be ignorant, then you don't fear him, right? 
The only way to fear him is to acknowledge he is who he says he is. And if he says he's all powerful, if nothing's too hard for him, and the world we live in today is the world we live in today, then we have to seek his face. We have to turn to him with all our heart. We have to appeal to a living God. Amen. In these last days. And I'm going to get to why we're here in a minute. But I want to give some examples about how God's all powerful. He created humanity in six days, all of humanity, all of the world in six days. And on the seventh, he rested for emphasis. He didn't need to rest, but he did. Well, what does that mean? That means if God can create the world in six days, he could have created it in a second. He could have created it in a year. He just chose the number seven to represent completion and all of this. And he helped us understand what he created. And he helped us use the Genesis account to fight back against things like evolution and all these devilish concepts that come into the world today. But if God can do that, could he not heal our land? Could he not just make a thought? Could he not just think a thought and do it? You know, we recently taught about the centurion and how uh, the centurion's servant was ill. And he, he told uh, those uh, the, the, to go see Jesus and say, hey, look, Jesus, I'm not worthy that you come into my house. I'm not even worthy that you come into my presence. But just speak it. Just think it. And my servant will be healed. Is that how we look at God? Is that how we reference God? If we were to reverence God that way, maybe he would heal our land. Are we praying that he heals our land? We should be. He created humanity in six days. He sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. And we're going to get to that in a minute. And he kept a broken world from spinning off into chaos. Have you ever thought about that? Look at what God's done for you. He's given you shelter. He's given you a work. He's given you um, hot water. He's given you a car. He's given you gas in the car. He's given you food to eat. I mean, if you look at the way that God is in the details and how much he has blessed you, I mean, look, if we just get um, an extra order of fries at the drive-thru, and I love the drive-thru, if we get an extra order of fries, that's God just blessing us, okay? If we get a, you know, we'll tell them, hey, you gave us extra fries, and they say they can't take it back. Oh, well, that's our, our uh, reward. But I know it's a silly example, but anything, if you think about how your car should have broken down, but it still runs, how you should have had to go to the doctor and you haven't, how, how you got that uh, check in the mail right when you needed it. If you think of what God's done for you, I want you to think about this for a minute. Think about 7.7 .7 billion people. That is, is, is who God has been working to help and to turn to him. 7.7 .7 billion people, the population of the world. God's all powerful. And again, I make this argument to, to show you that God is sovereign, he's holy, and his judgment is coming to the world. Now on to part two. Thank you again for sticking with us here on part two. What is part two? What God calls us to do. So I've made the argument that we are living in a broken, chaotic world that's only getting worse, not getting better. And now I've also made the argument that God is sovereign. And so the question then begs, what does God want us to do? Why are we here? What does he want us to do while we're here? What is the purpose of this life? We are to live for God, to bring joy to him, to glorify him. And that comes through a person, one person alone, and that is Jesus Christ. Uh, John 12, 32, uh, in, in my Bible here, uh, I'll read that, John 12, 32. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And so this is Jesus speaking the red letter text saying that if I be lifted up, well, when was he lifted up? He was lifted up on the cross. He will draw all men unto him. Look, this is our purpose for being here is to understand that Jesus Christ was lifted up on that cross, died for our sins. He paid our sin debt. What does that mean? That means that he was crucified on the cross. You know, the word excruciating literally means crucifixion uh, in, in the language. He died for us on the cross. He died for our sins. We had a sin debt that could not be paid on our own. The Bible says that our good works, they're like uh, dirty gauze pads. They're like dirty rags. Our righteousness is as dirty rags. And uh, our righteousness is all of it, okay? Nothing is excluded from that. And so how are we saved? How do we gain favor with God? Why are we left here? Number one, most importantly, to accept Jesus Christ as Savior, which is a free gift. That's something that God gives us. Jesus already died on the cross, was buried three days, rose again, uh, was resurrected by God miraculously, 
walked the earth for 40 days and 40 nights and ascended up to heaven and is with the Father today at the right hand of the Father. He is all that we need. He has done all that we need him to do. And so when we accept Jesus Christ as Savior, and that idea is simply just accepting what he did for us, just saying, I believe, I accept him as Savior, I will make him Lord of my life. I, I believe in God and God is higher than me, so I'll make him Lord of my life. When we do that, when we accept him in our hearts, when we believe in Jesus Christ dying on the cross, then we're saved. Amen? We're saved. That's the gospel message. Not about joining churches, not about good works, not about money or pedigree or anything. It is all about Christ crucified on the cross. The blood of Jesus atoned for our sins. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. There's no payment for sin. And so I urge you today, if you have not been saved, please pray this prayer. Pray that Jesus Christ come into your heart. Pray that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. Pray that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior God. We try to end most services with an altar call. Um, and, and, you know, we don't always do it in our, our small little church with the same members, but even my own children, my youngest children, they're getting old enough now uh, to, to maybe understand that they're sinners. They got a lot of sin in them, if you know my kids. Uh, I love my kids, but they're wild. Uh, but we, we try to, even the kids, because it's so simple, even a child can understand that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And so number one, the reason we're here in this crazy old world, when God is all powerful and can do anything he wants, the reason we're here is to accept Jesus as Savior, to accept his free gift of salvation. Uh, you can go down Romans Road. That's a, a way, way we often do it is go through Romans Road, where the scripture in the book of Romans that the Apostle Paul wrote outlines the, the plan of salvation. And I believe it's uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, gives the entire, entire gospel account as well. And so we go through scripture, we learn who Jesus is, what he did for us, we accept his free gift of salvation, we're saved, amen. Then you know what happens? Our name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. Our Father in heaven is happy. I heard great preaching on this the other day. The idea that we always quote the verse, there's angels rejoicing over one lost sinner that comes to repentance, that comes to being saved. But it, it was the, angel, uh, the angels in the presence of angels rejoicing or something like this, which means that God is the one rejoicing. You want to make God happy? You want to fulfill God's purpose for your life? Accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, I bet you know where I'm going with this. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, what are you going to do next? Well, you're going to turn to him and live for him. And what would he want you to do? Well, he'd want you to share that free gift of salvation. He'd want you to bring glory to his name. He'd want you to make him the priority. He made you. He has a plan for you. And start thinking about <clears throat> how this does not jive with the world system. The little G God of this world, the devil wants to do everything to confuse you, keep you too busy, keep you out of church, keep you out of the book, amen. The devil wants to just keep you in his world system. And if he can do that, then you'll stay far off from God. And God's saying, well, what would I want you to do? You accepted me as savior. You, you accepted me as, uh, you know that you didn't make yourself. You know that, uh, you know, the, all the ways that humanity operates, all, you know, the, what you see the birds flying in array. Uh, you see the, the wind take up the seed from a plant and blow and then drop it. And then that plant springs up. You see how the cloud turns into the rain, which turns back into the water, which turns back into the cloud. You see how uh, the tree, how the, the air the, I'm messing this up, but the oxygen, the carbon dioxide, and all of this, it all goes in a cycle. You see all these things. Who did that? God did that. Why did God do that? To testify of his creation, to testify of his majesty, of his power, of his sovereignty, of his creative brilliance. And we are what? We are stiff-necked. We are just like the people in the Old Testament. We are going astray. We're going here and there. And you say, well, Brother Clark, I'm not going after idols. I don't have a little statue in my room. Well, what do you value most? Where is your heart at? Where your heart at, where your heart is, that's where your treasure is, the Bible says. Is your heart for the things of God? Is your heart for being saved and then winning souls to Jesus? Now, I, as a preacher, can only tell you about salvation, 
Jesus Christ, by the working of the Holy Spirit, does the saving. I will never take credit for anyone to be saved. I'll simply try to plant that seed and lead them to the Lord. And the Lord will convict you. That's that funny feeling that you might feel here today. The Lord will convict you. And I beg you, friend, to pray and ask him to save you for it's eternally too late. And if you're saved, get off your bottom rear end. (laughs) Get off your butt uh, and win souls. Amen. You say, well, how can you win souls? If you can't go knock on a door anymore, you can send a gospel track. You can testify. You got social media. Go onto that, those platforms and write a story about what Jesus Christ has done in your life. Don't be ashamed. The Bible says if you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you. Don't be ashamed. Amen. Going back to our text verse here, John 12, 32. If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus foretold his crucifixion before the Passover to the people in this verse. He showed people he came to do the Father's will. He was obedient. We should mirror that. His words are God's words. He lets people know this must happen as had been uh, prophesied and is foretold that some would believe and many wouldn't. But he was lifted up on the cross for you. He died for you. And that's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And it was so painful and so hard for, for anyone to endure. And he, he prayed and said, Lord, just let this cup pass from me if it be your will. But if not, let your will be done. That's a really difficult prayer to make when you are about to be crucified and tortured and have a death worse than any death that was ever uh, in mankind, of mankind. And what do we do with this? You say, well, that's, that, that, that grieves me and I'm saved. And now, now what do I do? Well, let me tell you what you do. The tool we use to deepen our faith and share our faith is this book, the Bible. Amen. The Bible, the King James Bible. We use this Bible to win souls. We use this Bible to edify and to learn Uh, some scripture on that. Uh, I can't say the Bible is how we use a tool for God and there's no scripture. Uh, Number one, Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. How do you hear? By the word of God, right? That's where the faith comes from. That's how you deepen your faith is by Romans 10, 17. And the Bible guides us in life. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word, thy word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And then the word is Jesus. John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word became flesh. You know, the word is synonymous with Jesus Christ. Amen. In the end of the world, when Jesus comes back to avenge all the wicked ones that were coming to destroy God's people in the battle of Armageddon, you could read about it in Revelation 19. It's fascinating. When Jesus comes back, he's on that white horse. He's got angels with him. They're on white horses, amen. He's got all these people with him. And how does he wipe out all of these evil forces of all humanity? How does he wipe it out? With the word. It's a sword that is the word. So our prescription for deepening our faith and becoming on fire for God is getting in the living word to study it, to apply it, and to look to share it. We must be saved before it's eternally too late. I hope I made clear how to be saved. We must share the word before it's eternally too late. And we must do this now as a top priority. All right, almost done. On to point number three. Part three here today, sharing Jesus in a broken world. Look, why are we here? What are we doing here? We are here to share Jesus Christ with this broken and lost world. That's why we're here. That should be our priority. Our text verse states, if he be lifted up, he will draw all men unto him. Well, are we lifting him up today? What does that mean to lift Jesus up? I mean, specifically, he was speaking of the cross, right? But figuratively, here in today, in 2021 and 2022 and 2023 and beyond, if the Lord tarries, how do we lift Jesus Christ up? Well, what we have to do is be witnesses for him. And people think, well, I'm not a Bible scholar. I've got a full-time job. I'm in school all the time. Hey, God is calling everyday, average, ordinary people Look at who were his disciples, amen? They were everyday, ordinary people. Uh, They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. Uh, Yeah, there was a doctor in there, uh, but there was a lot of ordinary folks in there. And what we see is the Lord is calling you, 
uh, where you are, not just the preacher, not just the Bible teacher, and not just the, the, those that we classified as uh, fundamentalists or whatever you want to call them. Um, we all should be fundamentalists. We all should believe in the tenets and the word of God is fully true. Uh, but he's calling everyone to be a witness for him, to lift his name up, and he'll draw all men unto me, unto him. Uh, that's what he's saying, he'll draw all men unto himself. Amen. So what do we do here? We share the good news. Now, you can do that through a testimony. You could do that through um, telling others about Jesus. Uh, you could do that through sharing scripture. You can do that through going into the ministry and showing Christ's love and, and, and showing great generosity and loving the brothers and sisters. You can do that through prayer. We all should be praying. Uh, but the idea is that sinners need Christ. And who will tell them? Who will go? Who will stand in the gap? That's why the Bible says that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There's very few people that want to do this. And the question is, why? Why is it? You find people that want to jump out of an airplane. You find people that want to climb up a mountain. You find people that want to race a car. I saw a video uh, a month ago or so about somebody racing. There was a car. It was, like a, it was like a dirt track, but it was a car with an RV attached. And they would go in a figure eight. And the idea was all these cars would eventually collide. That is insane. And people were laughing and stuff, but that you're risking your life. They'll do all that. But you say, hey, could you go tell this person about Jesus? Hey, could you be a witness to this person? Hey, would you go ahead and uh, not go and be involved in this sinful thing or that sinful thing because it's a poor witness for Christ? People say, oh, are you kidding me? Are you crazy? Why? Because the world is broken and we're swimming upstream doing that. And it's very difficult to do that. But we, that's, you know, everybody's looking for the secret to happiness, the secret to uh, fulfillment, the secret to joy. That is joy. Joy is in Jesus. It's in sharing Jesus. Pure joy is when you see a soul that was lost and headed for hell, that's one to Christ, that will be in eternity with Christ because you helped do that. God is all powerful. He has allowed us he has given us the opportunity to go serve. It is not something that we can do on our own. It's not something that he needs us to do. He has chosen to allow us to do it. And you say, why, Brother Clark? Why is he going to allow us to do that? Well, there's rewards in heaven for those that serve the Lord. We read about the idea that, that uh, at the Bema seat, which is called the judgment seat, but the idea is a reward for those that have been saved, for those whose name is in the Lamb's book of life, for those that have accepted Jesus' free gift of salvation. They're not under condemnation. They're not there to be uh, condemned for what they didn't do. They're to be rewarded for what they did do out of a pure heart for Jesus, out of a pure heart and love for God, doing things for the right motivation. Uh, if I went tomorrow and leased the building and said, I'm going to put a coffee shop in here and this is for the Lord. And deep down, I just wanted to make coffee all day because I like doing that. That's not for the Lord. I could put the Lord's name on there, but at the end of the day, it's not for the Lord. And that wouldn't get a reward in heaven. But let's say I went down the street and I saw some kids and they had a ratty old jacket and I went back and I found a jacket and I gave them the jacket and I didn't tell a soul, and I didn't put it on social media, and I didn't brag about it, and no one knew about it but God. And when I gave that jacket, I said, I give this to you in Jesus' name. That's rewarded, I believe. God, only God knows, but that's rewarded. So we are to live for Christ, not, not because we have to, but because we should want to. Not because we're obliged to, but because we love the Lord and we should be serving him. Uh, think about it. An all-powerful God, all-knowing God sent Christ to save us and then leave us here in this broken world to live for ourselves, to go on vacation all the time, to be uh, uh, belittling others, to gossip all the time, to fight, to squirmish. Is that why God left us here? No, he left us here to tell people about Jesus, to be good citizens the best we can, not to offend. You know, oftentimes Jesus will say in the scriptures, uh, let's do this so we don't offend. You know, they'll ask him to pay taxes. He said, okay, go to, go to the water, pull me out, uh, you know, pull me out what you need, the coin, and, and we'll do this so we don't offend, right? So we live peacefully. We don't offend. We don't talk bad about people. Uh, we don't cuss. We don't swear. We don't get drunk. We live a sober, peaceful life, and we become witnesses for Christ. We repent of our sins every day. We ask God to forgive us, to heal us, to help us, and, and to just continue to be with us, not because 
We need salvation, once saved, always saved. We believe in eternal security, but so that we can win souls to the lost, so that we can be on fire for him, so that we can have a heart for what he has a heart for. And let me say this and I'll be done. God left us here to be witnesses to others. And that makes us wise. Not only to bring joy, it makes us wise. Amen. It's hard to find a wise person these days. Proverbs 11, 30 through 31. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. So we see a clear choice. We see that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and we see that he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. That's what I'm urging you to do. That's why I'm saying God has you here to be saved and to win souls, uh, to, to, to be saved and then to produce fruit, as the Bible would say, and that we will be recompensed. The idea of recompense is to return in kind. It is a very much a biblical idea. You read it all through scripture. People that do evil, get into the book of Proverbs. People that do evil, receive evil. People that do good, receive good. Now, that is evil in God's sight and good in God's sight. And to do good without God is blasphemy. It is uh, abomination. It's awful. So it's not good like you think. It's good like God thinks. And what God thinks is good is to accept his free gift of salvation. He sa- In his word, he says he wants all to come to repentance, all to be saved. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell with the devil. To accept his free gift of salvation and then to live for him and to share the gospel and you'll be recompensed for what you do for him. And, uh, and really, if you think about this, what does it come down to? In the end, what does it come down to? I mentioned the beginning, fear of God. And the other F word would be faith in God. Faith. Abraham was justified by faith. We are justified by faith. The idea that we believe in Christ, not just as our Savior, but as our best friend. And as the one that will lead us and guide us. And as the one that we want others to know. As the one that we want to share with others. And as we do that, the Holy Spirit just gets to work in our hearts. And we're able to win souls to him and we're able to tell people about him. And then when we keep doing that one day, he'll call us home and he'll say what? He'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that, that it would be uh, just the best day of our lives to have that said to us by Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ that died for us. The least we can do is serve him. He gave his life for us and he lives today and he's in full control and he's allowed everything to happen for a reason. And we know that we should be living for him. Romans 8, 28 tells us that all things are, uh, that, that happen to the believer are for our good, for those that love the Lord, those that are called according to his purpose. So everything that's happened, it's for a reason. Let's go out and win souls. Let's tell them about Jesus. Let's do it today. I pray for you to have courage and determination to do it today. I thank you so much for watching this video. And you're always welcome to come to our church, Heartland Community Baptist Church, 2424 East Main Street, Lincolnton, North Carolina. I don't know the zip code, but look up Lincolnton. We're on that main road. And hopefully we'll be back in person soon. Love you so much. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much for watching. Now I want to do something. I just want to pray real quick uh, just to end the service. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for blessing us, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to have your words reach our hearts, Lord. I ask you now, to apply it to the hearts of those that listen, Lord. I ask you now, Lord, to just prick their hearts, Lord. Get them excited for what you're doing here today in these last days. Have them to be saved before it's eternally too late, Lord. Let them get on fire for you once they're saved and share your gospel, the good news, with the whole world. We thank you so much, Lord, and we just thank you for blessing us. And we ask you, Lord, to be with us this week. Lord, help us to just do as you'd have us to do and to make it back here at the next appointed time, whether it be virtually or in the building. We love you, Lord, so much. In Jesus' name, amen.